Okay, hi everyone, welcome back. And can you believe next week will be spring break? So you have the entire break, well, to do what you want because like, I'm not going to sign anything or like uh, expect you to post on Packback. Actually, that was a good question someone brought up. Like, can you post on Packback during spring break? So it's not going to be part mandate or anything. Actually, remember that you have flexibility. But if you post on Packback, you can get points during that time. So it's not that it won't count. So again, this, there's no extra credit. It's whether you get that maximum 1200 by the end of the semester. But say you missed five weeks, then you can use spring break as a chance to make up that fifth week that you missed. So you can post during pack back or you can work ahead. Like if you want to, to like get, a, get your pack back requirement over quicker, you can also post during spring break. But again, spring break is a break for a reason. So it's up to you whether you want to post during spring break or not. Okay, so let's get on with today's lecture. So we're going to continue with the vasculature. And before we start, so what we have is our, our learning goals. And again, I'm going to make an effort to include these before every lecture. So here they are. Okay, back to our vital signs. So again, all the vital signs can be read if you've seen one of these hospital monitors. Now let's go on to our next vital sign. So what we're going to look at today is this vital sign over here. So what that looks like is like a fraction, right? So it's not actually a real, fra it's represented as a full vulgar fraction, but it's not something you solve and reduce to a decimal. So remember our four vital signs, the classic, I mean, there are other institutions, sometimes like EMTs or hospitals or other things say like there's a fifth or sixth vital signs, but these four are canonically accepted by most institutions. So what we, we already covered heart rate, which is related to pulse because again, the heart is the one that's driving circulation. And then today we're gonna focus on blood pressure, sometimes abbreviated just BP. Now, this is the graph we showed earlier, showing you the average blood pressure across the different types of vessels in your body. But what we have, what it actually looks more like is like this. So notice that we, in the arteries, we actually have a big amplitude. It goes up and down, up and down, and why? Well, remember that your aorta and all the arteries that are closer and like compared to the, to over, in the overall blood flow of your heart, they're closer to the heart compared to things like your capillaries, venules, veins, and the vena cava. So the closer it is, the higher the pressure. But, and oh, and then also like what we have here is like, okay, we notice that it's bouncing between these two pressures over here. So this upper bound is our systolic blood pressure and this lower bound is our diastolic because again, the heart contracts, that squeezes, that increases pressure. When it relaxes, that lowers the pressure. So that's what's diastolic blood pressure. So notice that this starts to dampen as you go travel further and further away from the heart. Is lymphatics going to be there? So I'm actually going to update the schedule for the calendar. So lymphatics, I'm putting to unit three. So lymphatic anatomy won't be on um, exam two. Okay, so or blood pressure. So we're going to establish our reference value for blood pressure in this class. So for this class, both systolic and diastolic be below 120 over 80. Now again, this is what do these numbers mean? Well, they're two numbers. So that means less than 120 millimeters mercury systolic. And that's why I'm showing this thing here. Now, do I want you to know how the unit millimeters mercury was established? I think that's more if you're interested in that stuff, but just know it's a unit of pressure. And this is how they used to do it, but I'm not, I'm not gonna expect you to know like how it was like derived back in the day. And then diastolic, again, when the heart is relaxed, it's below 80. So the, our normal is both numbers have to be low, be below 120 and systolic and below 80 diastolic. So, and the th common misconception, they think this is a fraction. So they say, oh, the blood pressure is 1.5. It's not like math where this is a division symbol. It's just showing you a separation between the systolic and diastolic. So you always see the systolic number first, then the diastolic after. So the, why do I choose these values? Because these are the ones based on CDC and the National Institutes of Health data. So again, when you're doing research on this stuff, you have to kind of use some sort of standards and these are commonly used standards what we're going to go with here. Now, there are different, uh, some hospitals and institutions and researchers and some maybe countries might use different values, but for this class, this is our normal blood pressure. 
So why am I using these guidelines? Well, it's also in line with the uh, American College of Cardiologists and American Heart Association guidelines for blood pressure. So normal, no set, it has to be and. It's not just like either. It's like both the one less than 120 systolic and one less than 180, or no, one less than 80, less than 80 diastolic. So less than 120 systolic and less than 80 diastolic. Now elevated is when it's almost like it's above these numbers, but what it's not quite like a, a jump of over 10, at least in the systolic. And notice that it's still diastolic has to be less than 80. But say you're like 125 over 81, that might mean that you have you have elevated blood pressure according to these guidelines, and they update these every so often. And I checked this year, I checked like in last week, and they haven't updated it yet. So this is what we're going with. High blood pressure, also called hypertension. However, hypertension is high blood pressure, so that's the medical term. Notice that once you go over, you jump over 10 points on systolic, then you're now in stage one hypertension. Or you have this, this diastolic over 80, you have that stage one hypertension. Now, when stage two, now you go to 140 or higher, so this is a jump of 20 points above normal, and here you jump over 10 points. But when you're at like hypertensive crisis, this is where you, it's pretty urgent. So you should uh, they have one higher than 180 and one higher than 120. But what I want you to focus on for this class is like nor knowing what a normal blood pressure is and what stage one hypertension is. So when are you hypertensive? When are you have do you have normal blood pressure? Now abnormal blood pressure again hypertension hyper meaning above and excessive. So high blood pressure is hypertension. So either number, so either greater than 130 systolic or greater than 80 diastolic. And older textbooks and the Martini textbooks actually has the old, even though that I think the latest edition came out in 2018, that's one thing with Martini. They tend not to update their like text content and this is one where they're using old guidelines. So older textbooks may list 140 over 90, but these, these numbers, 130 over 80 for hypertension, this is the most recent data. And why did they lower it? Well, the thing is that if you have someone like 130 over 85, they could be hypertensive, but with the old guidelines, you would not consider that. So you wouldn't treat them or try to see if they have the complications of hypertension. So they lowered the threshold to kind of catch more people who were suffering from the effects and symptoms, or I should say from the effects of hypertension. So they were trying to catch more of these cases of hypertension versus like having a higher threshold. So that's why they lowered it. Now hypotension, there are different, actually like the definition and cutoffs of hypotension are much more varied than the hypertension cutoffs. So with that, what we're going to do is going to, again, hypo is the opposite of hyper. So this is low blood pressure. So either number less than 90 over 60, that's what we'll use for this class. Again, different textbooks, different institutions. There is less consensus on hypotension and the guidelines for that, but we'll establish this for this class. But you definitely know it's definitely way below 120 over 80. Okay, so let's go to our live questions. And let's start this question right here. It's a simple true or false. The most common symptoms of hypertension are headaches. So around 90% of people with hypertension have headaches and nosebleeds. So around 60% of people have nosebleeds. True or false? And if you're watching from home, pause the video, think about it and say, hmm, true or false? Okay, let's see what the audience said. So most of you said true, but actually these are not common symptoms of hypertension. Next question. So most people who have essential hypertension, so I don't expect you to know the difference between essential, what essential hypertension is compared to other types, but basically it's saying like you have hypertension, but it's not caused due to something like a hormonal imbalance or what we call secondary hypertension. That means you have a disease that's causing hypertension, like things like problems with your thyroid hormones, they can also cause a change in blood pressures. But we're just talking about people who have hypertension by itself, not caused by something else. Again, if you're watching at home, pause the video. All right, so what, we're, what are the responses? The responses are, 
true or false? So most of you said that true. They do not display obvious symptoms, and you are correct. So this is the interest. This is why it's important to catch these cases of hypertension and screen for it, because most people who have hypertension that are, and are undiagnosed, they're totally unaware of it. So this is why hypertension is sometimes called the silent killer. So because why people might have hypertension, but they're not showing obvious symptoms. Yes, some people with hypertension, they might have headaches, sometimes they might have nosebleeds, but they're far from the majority of cases. Most cases of people who have undiagnosed essential hypertension, they do not display obvious symptoms, so they're unaware of it. So why is hypertension so dangerous? Well, pressure is kind of high, and isn't it good to have like high pressure and have good blood distribution? Well, the thing is that hypertension, like a lot of high pressures, or if you have like a high pressures pounding your um, like, like your windows or the your house or like a, during a hurricane, you have a lot of air pressure and water pressure blasting your house. That's going to damage the structures. Same with hypertension. High pressures damage things over time. Or like in recent news, you saw that if you've seen on North Shore, there's that house that collapsed because of the waves constantly pounding the, the beach and the, the land that was holding up that house and that house slid back. So having high blood pressure over time will damage your cardiovascular system and tissues. So one thing is that it can cause coronary heart disease, so it damages the blood vessels that supply your heart. It can also lead to myocardial infarction, which we covered earlier this semester. So again, can remember that coronary heart disease, like clogging up your arteries, can also cause that. So it's all kind of interrelated with this. What else can it cause? It can cause aneurysms. So remember that our vessels have that histology in the walls of our vessels. So if there's a weak point, that can cause an artery to bulge out. So what happens if an aneurysm breaks? Well, that can lead to a stroke, right? A cerebrovascular accident can also happen. And the thing about hypertension, it's not just about the brain and the heart. It can also affect other organs, such as the kidneys. And it can also cause and another heart disease right here, atrial fibrillation. So hypertension can cause a litany of all these other diseases that can happen as a result of hypertension. And all these, if left untreated, can be deadly. So this is why hypertension is very, very serious. Now, what's it what we're going to look at here? Now, you notice that with this, we have our systolic and our diastolic. So I definitely expect you to know how to read a simple what, like blood pressure reading like that. But what is this number right here? Is it related? Is it just a random number? Is it debugging? Well, it's actually another thing called mean arterial pressure, and it is related to the blood pressure right here. Now, what is MAP or mean arterial pressure? Well, what it is is the average pressure driving blood stuff into the artery. So if it drive, it's basically the average pressure, arterial pressure, causing perfusion in your body. Now the normal range, again, this is, I'm choosing it for this class, different institutions and it might have different values, so maybe, but I'm going to establish it as 70 to 110 millimeters mercury. So what happens here is this is how you get mean arterial pressure. So what you have is, this is one formula. There's actually another formula you can use, but this is one formula you can calculate the mean arterial pressure. You take the diastolic pressure and then add one third of what you call pulse pressure. Now, pulse pressure is new, so what is pulse pressure? Well, remember that we have our systolic up here and our diastolic over here. So that mean arterial pressure is this line right here. Notice that it's not just a simple average where you just take 50-50 of systolic and diastolic. And why? Because you notice that, like, okay, this these dips over here, it has to deal with like these, it's not just like simple on offs on off. It's actually like due to the curvature of this. That's why mean arterial pressure is approximated this way. So if you did take like the average and you, you would have to use some calculus to do this as well. So this is why mean arterial pressure is approximated this way. And this is why I mean by this. It's like the actual way to measure mean arterial pressure is that you actually need to insert something, something into an arteries which is very invasive and pretty painful. So this is a way of getting it without actually having to invade someone's blood vessels. So this is why it's an estimate. It's very close to the actual value, but it's not the exact value. But for this, the intents and purposes of this class, consider it the same.
So what is pulse pressure? So pulse pressure is the pressure the heart generates with every contraction, and that's what we have here. We have the heart contracting, then relaxing. So contracting, relaxing, contracting. So th basically what the pulse pressure is, is the difference between the systolic and diastolic pressure. So you just take this number up here and subtract here, and you have the pulse pressure. So that's what we have for pulse pressure. And this is why if you feel someone's pulse, that's why it's not constant. And it doesn't have like a constant, it has a kind of like, you feel that little beating, right? So this is why it, you also have feel that in the pulse. With the normal pulse, it should match a heart rate because again, the heart is generating those increases and drops in pressure. So pulse pressure and then the, is also, so this is the formula for pulse pressure, very simple mathematics, just takes the difference between systolic and diastolic. Now, this is also, also another formula you can use. You can just do the simple algebra, just a sim simple substitution. So this is another formula you can use. Which one do I want you to know? You can use either. As long as you know these two formulas, you can actually get both this third formula for free. So whichever works best for you, choose one. Like I, I prefer this one actually, uh, two thirds diastolic, one third systolic. So again, it's not just simple half half, it's actually more toward the diastolic side than systolic. Okay, so why do we care about mean arterial pressure? Well, mean arterial pressure is a general measurement of perfusion and blood flow to tissues. So if you have a low MAP, that means you're not getting enough blood flow to tissues. So you're getting inadequate perfusion. And this, again, depends on institution. So if you dip below 60, and this is kind of generally accepted that 60 is kind of like when you're in the danger zone, that means like you're not getting enough pressure and not enough perfusion, so these tissues aren't getting enough blood. Now, what about the other side? So again, pressure is good for delivering things to, or delivering blood to your tissues, but high pressure also causes damage. So if you have a high MAP, over time, if you have uncontrolled hypertension, that can also lead to stress on organs, including the heart, and can also lead to further cardiovascular disease, just like what we saw with like aneurysms and strokes and even blood clots, myocardial heart attacks, heart enlargement. So yeah, the heart, if you have like high blood pressure, that actually pushes back on the heart. So the heart actually has to work even harder. And this is why sometimes like the heart can actually grow even bigger and actually there was a really good pack back question about that like can the should we grow our heart or can the heart grow so that's actually very important in heart health because yeah you can have like your heart working harder but there's a certain point of diminishing returns where the heart gets too big and that affects its function and efficiency but that's a topic for your future pathophysiology classes okay so let's go on to, so what's the easy way to get the blood pressure? I mean, you don't want to do a, the direct measurement of mean arterial pressure because you have to poke things in people. You don't need to poke people, think people to get the blood pressure. So what you can do is find the brachial artery. So brachial, if you know your landmarks, you know it's the arms. So the brachial artery is a very important landmark. If you're aligning one of these cuffs, you want to align these cuffs with the brachial artery. Now what we have here is a sphygmomanometer. manometer. I know those Greek words and those Greek phonemes, tricky, but this is why a lot of people just say BP cuff. So the actual real name is sphygmomanometer, manometer, but BP cuff, same thing. But you just don't use a BP cuff. This is going, this is like a little bladder and measure, you ramp up the pressure and then you deflate the cuff. So you can adjust the pressure inside the cuff. But you also use a stethoscope to listen to something we call carotid cough sounds. And what we have is like, okay, when you inflate the cuff, you actually have to inflate it above systolic pressure. So remember that systole is going to be the maximum pressure in our circulatory system because that's the pressure from our heart contracting and causing that massive increase in pressure. So that's systole. But if you go above systole, that means you're going above the pressure that the that the heart can generate and you're then the maximum pressure inside your entire cardiovascular system. Then you deflate the cuff, and then as you deflate, then these sounds can be heard in the stethoscope. So again, sphygmal manometer is that cuff, but the stethoscope is what you're actually listening to, to actually, so you can't, you can put your ear to a, to a sphygmal manometer, but if you don't have a stethoscope, you can't really hear it. 
and then you deflate it and then once you're below the diastolic blood pressure these sounds disappear so these sounds are very important in manually getting someone's blood pressure and why is that well laminar flow is very cool so what we it's kind of like if you so but this is what you would hope is happening in your blood vessels is that you have undisturbed flow of fluid and blood so that doesn't actually, I mean, it does, it's very smooth, very efficient, and you don't have what you call turbulence. So here we have a narrowing, maybe due to some sort of like atherosclerosis and some fatty plaques. And then this is causing turbulence. And notice that the blood is no longer sm flowing smooth and parallel. Now we have these little eddies and swirls. Now why is that related to these Karotkov sounds? Well, laminar flow has minimal noise, and actually look up these interesting videos like online about if, if you're really into this um, of like a gar like water flowing like laminar flow with water or garden hose. It's very cool. It almost looks like an icicle. It's like so smooth. So laminar flow is just very smooth flow, and there's going to be minimal noise. Whereas turbulence, this is the one. The turbulence is noisy in general. So this is going to cause tapping and swishing noises you hear in these Karotkov noises. So analogy time. Turbulence, which makes more noise? This, a river flowing like this, or white water rapids? So a very smooth flowing current versus a very turbulent churning current. The one that has more turbulence, right? Or assuming you fly, so again, here we have a smooth flight versus a turbulent flight. So if you've been in flight turbulence, you know not only is it kind of scary because you're bouncing around, but it's also very noisy. So if you're sleeping, you're going to be woken up by this. So turbulence, we had liquid turbulence in the previous example. Now we have air turbulence. But what's happening is that instead of having nice flow across like an airplane and wings here, now we have these eddies, now we have these bumps. Same with between air and between um, air and liquid so again you have sound is vibration so turbulence is some sort of eddy some sort of vibration that's causing these sounds so if you have turbulent flow through a blood vessel that's going to cause sounds now what we have is like so this is why you need to inflate that cuff above that systolic pressure because again the maximum pressure you can have in your blood vessels is systolic pressure so if the cuff is greater than systolic pressure, it's going to hold this blood vessel shut. So it's like someone trying to lift, uh, like if your your blood vessels are you and you're trying to lift way more than you can, you can't push up against the weight. You're kind of stuck there, right? So that's what's happening at this first phase when you have the cuff pressure greater than systolic pressure. So there's no flow because the blood vessel is completely pinched off. So no sounds because the artery is completely closed. But once this cuff pressure dips below systolic pressure over here, now we get the tapping. So every time we have this, like when we have the systolic rear than cuff pressure, that's going to open up the blood vessel. But when it's kind of like this and still above diastolic, so diastolic is when it's fully relaxed. Now instead of being fully closed, it's going to be partially open, but it's all partially open because again, some, it depends whether the cuff pressure is greater than the the vessel pressure so it's going to be kind of like opening in very slightly and this is going to cause little eddies and these turbulent right here so this causes those Karotkov noises those sounds because now the cuff pressure is between it so the the vessels are partially open in this as long as you're between these two pressures so because the cut artery is partially open that causes turbulence this causes those noises we hear when we listen to a BP cuff and using a um, um, stethoscope. And then below diastolic pressure, now the cuff pressure is below the minimum pressure inside this blood vessel. So because this cuff pressure is now very weak, now it's like like lifting a very, if you, even if you have a off day, maybe lifting a piece of paper or something very easy to lift. So now the vessels are completely open because even at its minimal pressure, it's going to push up and keep open that blood vessel because again it easily pushes against this now very minimal cuff pressure so now we have laminar flow back again and this is why we don't have noise because now the vessels are completely open so we won't have the turbulent flow anymore so no noise in outside of the systolic and diastolic range 
but when it's between the systolic and diastolic, that's why we have the cup pressure. So the great thing is that when you first hear the sounds, that's your systolic. Because why? Because below systolic, then you start hearing the sounds. But when the sounds disappear, that's your diastolic reading. So this is why you need to have good hearing to take blood pressure manually. So when the sounds first appear, that's systolic. And that's why you also have to pay attention to that little dial because you have to like listen. It's like, okay, I right, hear sound. Where was the number? And then you're listening to sounds and then wait until they disappear and then take the number right after. So that's your diastolic. So, but again, a lot of clinics, it's done automatically, but this is like a good thing to kind of relate these sounds. It also tells you a little about hemodynamics as well, or if you go to a rural clinic, or say your power is out, can you still get blood pressure? Yeah, you don't need any electronics for that. So I, I think I'll leave this for you to watch at home, but it's a, it's a great example showing you like the blood pressure in cuff inflating deflating and also these sounds in this waveforms down here. So I'll leave you, uh, you should watch that because I think it's a really great example of that. Okay, so let's talk about our next section right here. So we talked about blood pressure and now let's talk about the, what happens on the vessel level. Okay, so here's a capillary bed. So this is the open stacks version. And if we look at it, we covered the different types of capillaries. Now, what happens inside the capillaries? So I talked about how the capillaries are very called exchange vessels because they exchange things with their surrounding tissues. But how, what exactly gets exchanged and what drives this exchange? So notice that this is inside the vessel, inside the capillary, and we have things like amino acids, all these things that are dissolved in the fluid part. We're not showing the cells in this example, even though they're there. But we have the fluid inside a capillary and the surrounding interstitial fluid in the tissues that surround that capillary. So notice that things like big things like blood proteins, they're not filtering through, but small things like ions, glucose, and you can't see it in this example, but showing you over here, water molecules. So tiny things can, if there's a little opening, they can actually squeeze between any small openings between the endothelial cells of a capillary. Now, here's a capillary, and again, our heart is the pump, and the pump is generating all that force. So that force is going to drive the blood throughout these the, our blood vessels, including our capillaries. But what happens if we have little gaps between our endothelial cells and our capillary? Well, think of it this way. So here, I like you another hose analogy. Here we have a garden hose, high pressure. That's why the heart, it, the the water is like shooting out like this. So just like our heart circulates and pumps blood, what if you poke little holes in this hose? Well, you might have seen this in gardening where there's like little holes to help water your lawn. So if you have little holes, it's going to spring leaks to the surrounding area. Same with your capillaries. So if there are small little holes between the cells that line the capillaries then again, we have all this pressure from the heart. So what's going to happen is that as the heart beats, this pressure is going to force fluid out of these pores and into the surrounding tissues. So this is one major force that can help to drive for the fluid from the capillaries to the surrounding tissues. It's due to all the pressure, blood pressure inside those vessels. But there's a more specific term for this pressure over here we'll cover in a few slides. So this is called capillary hydrostatic pressure. So hydrostatic pressure refers to the pressure due to some sort of fluid. In this case, it's the, blood, the fluid component of our blood. So capillary hydrostatic pressure, there's actually other types of hydrostatic pressures in your body. So what makes capillary hydrostatic pressure different from the other parts? Well, think about it this way. Hydrostatic pressure, whatever's in front of it, that's your starting point. So you're starting with the fluid inside your capillaries and this capillary flat hydrostatic pressure is going to pr produce pressure that pushes against the walls of the capillary. So that's going to drive fluid out of the capillaries and into the surrounding tissues. Now capillary, so again, is from the inside out. So inside the capillaries pushing toward the outside and toward the walls into the surrounding tissues. And if you looked at, this is another diagram I, I created here. So what you have here is that Capillary hydrostatic pressure is going to move, push from the inside of the capillary toward the outside. So this is it's very important to understand this because it, this direction is important in understanding net filtration pressure, which we'll cover pretty soon. 
So arterial side, again, this is why I'm showing you that graph that shows you how the pressure drops going from arteries to arterioles to capillaries to venules to veins. So the arterial side and the venule side, the capillary hydrostatic pressure is actually going to drop as you transition through the capillary from the artery side to the vein side. So again, this is why it's, I really like to show that graph because it doesn't stay constant throughout the capillary. So the capillary hydrostatic pressure is strongest toward the artery side and it's lowest toward the venule side. So this process of going from the capillaries to the surrounding tissues is called filtration. So filtration goes from the inside of a capillary to the outside. Now, what we have and have here is like, so about filtration, this is generally how much liters happens per day. So your blood vessels are and capillaries are actually pushing a lot of fluid. There's, so it's not just staying in within blood vessels. Like the cell should stay, like your red blood cells should stay within your circulation. But the fluid itself, you actually push a lot of it due to the blood pressure into the surrounding tissues. Now, this is the OpenStax version which is information dense, but I think it's a little less accessible, but maybe you'll like it, I don't know. Whatever, go with whatever works for you. But what we have here is capillary hydrostatic pressure. Again, we have higher pressures because again, the arteries have higher pressures overall than the veins. So as you go tra travel through a capillary, you have more hydrostatic pressure. Therefore, you have more filtration toward the artery side, but as the blood pressure drops off, you're going to get less pressure, so you're going to get less movement of fluid to the surrounding tissues. And when you get to the vein side, you still have some capillary hydrostatic pressure, but less so than compared to the artery side. So again, this is a very important concept to understand with understanding capillary hydrostatic pressure. Now there's another pressure, and now this is called BCOP, I mean, sometimes it's just called COP, but it's like blood colloid osmotic pressure. Now blood colloid osmotic pressure is going in the opposite direction. So remember that CHP is pushing from the inside out, but BCOP is actually drawing fluid from the surrounding tissues into a capillary. So now it's going from the outside in. So BCOP, what is that? And actually the overall process of moving fluid back into your blood vessels is called reabsorption. So now this fluid is going back into a vessel. So what we have is reabsorption is around 20.4 liters per day. So even though you're losing around 24 liters of fluid from the inside of your blood vessels to the surrounding tissues due to filtration, you reabsorb a lot of that volume. And there is a slight difference, but where you are going to put off the lymphatic system. So yeah, chapter 21, lymphatics and immunology, that is actually put off to exam three because immunology is actually pretty complex. And to do it justice, instead of having you just cram it in in unit two, I'm actually, this is where my class kind of differs from other Phil 142 or AMP2. I actually put off immunology towards unit three because it's more important and deserves more time. Okay, so what we have here is BCOP, back to BCOP. Okay, so what it is is blood colloids and blood colloids, remember a colloid is a mixture. And this one is actually very, like a colloid is, your blood it has a mixture of many components, especially proteins. So these proteins are very important in actually drawing in this fluid. And we did talk about this to extent earlier in the semester, but this is where it pays off. So these plasma proteins, and again, your plasma has many things, water, salt, electrolytes, but also a lot of proteins that are dissolved in it. And proteins have a lot of charged amino acid residues that allow it to attract water or and vice versa. So this is why proteins are very important in kind of holding on to water and drawing water toward them. So this is why we have this blood colloid osmotic pressure drawing water and fluids toward the, the inside of a capillary because of all of these proteins, very attractive to water. So these water molecules are wanting to associate with all these proteins. So this is why, going back to that previous picture, why it's important to hold on to these, uh, have these very tiny pores, but not so big that they allow all the contents of, uh, of their plasma to just and blood to just filter through. So small molecules like water, sodium, glucose, amino acids, they can flow through, but these large blood proteins, because they're very important in holding on and attracting water, they stay in your capillaries if in a normal intact cardiovascular system. 
So large proteins such as albumins, they should stay in the blood. They should not pop through these small little pores. Now, oncotic pressure is, is a special type of osmosis, so you can have diffusion. Remember that diffusion is movement of molecules. But osmosis is special in the human body, or actually just in physiology in general, not just humans, in terms of the overall movement of water. So we talked about solutes like sodium, glucose, and other things that can attract water with osmosis. But oncotic pressure is like a, a specific form of osmosis due to the presence of proteins that attract water. Now here we have our blood, and we have a lot of proteins in our blood. And we have the interstitial fluid, which has proteins, but less cut so compared to the, our blood. So what we have here is that our blood, because it has more proteins, due to this oncotic pressure, so again, this is why my simplified version of that definition, osmotic pressure due to proteins, which way will the water go? So think if you're at home, pause, think about this. Just think about it. We have more proteins in our blood, less protein concentration in our interstitial fluid. And in the starting example, we have equal amounts of water. Which way will the water go, toward the blood or the interstitial fluid? So the answer is it will move toward the blood because why we want kind of balance between the concentration of proteins and the concentration of water. So this is why oncotic pressure is very powerful pressure in terms of maintaining BCOP. And this oncotic pressure helps to reabsorb and hold on to water in the bloodstream. So CHP affect trans hormone transport as well. Yeah, so CHP is also important, like not if, like some hormones can also diffuse across the, if there is a large enough pore, yeah, it can diffuse across there as well. And also in terms of like distributing hormones that are dissolved in our bloodstream, yeah, this can also be important in delivering it to the surrounding tissues. So it's not just hormone or like small solutes. If those hormones can dissolve and can be pushed into the strat, go through these pores, yeah, it can be delivered to these tissues. But again, remember that blood is the main carrier of hormones. Okay, so reabsorption is that general term meaning that you're, so remember like it's not, and why is it not just simply absorption? Because you did have it originally in this, this crack capillary here, but you're bringing it back. So it's kind of like recycling it and reusing it. So that's why it's called reabsorption, this overall process of bringing fluid back into a vessel. So reabsorption, notice that is pretty consistent and constant compared to CHP. And why is that? Well, because again, you don't want these blood proteins in a normal blood vessel filtering out. So because you have the same concentration of these blood proteins throughout your plasma, it should, reabsorption is relatively constant throughout your cardiovascular system. So oncotic pressure is that osmotic pressure due to proteins and due to these pores being very small, Large proteins should not filter out. So this is why this concentration of protein stays constant throughout from the arterial to venule side. Even though there's a lot of pressure, the pores aren't big enough to let the proteins through. So what's going to happen? Water is attracted to these proteins and these proteins also help to retain water in the vessels. So this is why oncotic pressure and thus BCOP is cons constant between from the artery side to the venule side of a capillary. So BCOP is important in drawing it back, but it's constant unlike CHP. So filtration and reabsorption, these are also directions. So filtration is from the inside of capillary out, and reabsorption is from the outside in. So there's due to, and a large part of that is due to oncotic and osmotic pressure. Now with filtration and reabsorption, notice that there is an interplay. So over here at the artery side, they're actually filtration and CHP wins out because it has a larger number. But uh, toward the vein side, notice that BCOP is larger than the capillary hydrostatic pressure. So it also depends like which pressure is greater. It depends on which side of a capillary you're on. Now, what is the overall effect? Well, if capillary hydrostatic pressure, again, it drops off as you go from artery to vein, but we also have that blood colloid osmotic pressure, which is pretty constant as you go from artery to vein. So notice that on the arterial side, the numbers for CHP are bigger. So this is why I'm representing in this diagram here. So because we have more force going from the inside out than from the outside in, though at the arteries, arterial side, you're going to have an overall movement of fluid outside of, or going from the inside of the vessel toward the outside. 
So more pressure, you're going to actually have more filtration on the arterial side of a capillary. So filtration is the greater, yeah, wins out in this side. But when you're around the middle, then these two are almost cut evenly matched. Doesn't mean that it's totally static. So you are getting the overall movement of molecules, but it's kind of like if you give your friend, like you lend your friend five bucks and your friend gives you five bucks back. Did either of you make money? No, because like I mean, you exchange money, but overall you're stuck. You're back where you started. So that's what we have here: is that the forces are balanced. There's no net movement of water. So water is still moving, but overall you don't have a chance, a uh, change in fluid volume in the capillary and surrounding tissues because they're matched. Now at the venule side, remember that artery pressure or CHP actually drops from artery to vein side. So now we have our CHP below our B cop. So now the protein is going to move at the toward the venule side, is going to move more fluid in on this side of the capillary. So now we have more reabsorption on the venule side because our B cop is greater than CHP. So to, if you like graphs, so what we have here is a graph of CHP uh, as we go from artery, arterial side to venule side. So notice that, again, remember just like how our pressures drop from arteries to veins. Same with the arterials and venules. So we have a drop in capillary hydrostatic pressure, but BCOP is relatively constant. So when hydrostatic pressure is greater than oncotic pressure, we have filtration leading to overall movement of fluid outside or toward the outside of the vessel. And hydrostatic pressure, once it dips below BCOP, again, now we have BCOP drawing more fluid back in than is being pushed out. So we're going to have overall movement of fluid back in to, at the venule side. And in between, they're roughly at this midpoint right here, they're evenly balanced. So they're equal, doesn't mean that there's no movement altogether, but the, in terms of the overall change in volume, it's evenly traded and balanced out so we don't have a chain have filtration or reabsorption or net filtration I should say. This relates to something called net filtration pressure. So what we do is take all the forces that are moving fluid in and out of a vessel and then say like okay which what's the overall direction and what's the overall trend? Do we have an overall trend of fluid moving out of a vessel or do we have fluid moving into a vessel? So in terms of our capillaries, and it is more complicated if you want to get very into the details, but for our the intents and purposes of this class, net filtration pressure in terms of capillaries is like in healthy, and we're in normal capillaries and normal cardiovascular systems that are undamaged. Net filtration pressure is basically the difference between capillary hydrostatic pressure and blood colloid osmotic pressure. Because why? Again, these two forces are opposing, so you just take the difference. So if capillary hydrostatic pressure is greater, it will win out, the number will be positive. If BCOP is greater than CHP, this number will be more negative, thus therefore making net filtration pressure negative. So this is how we're able to calculate. We just take the difference between CHP and BCOP, and then we have our net filtration pressure that tells you not only which direction the fluid is moving, but the magnitude and whether it's a little fluid moving or if it's a lot of fluid moving in or out of a blood vessel. So this is the formula we'll use for this class. Again, there are other pressures, but they're minimal in healthy individuals. So how do we calculate this? Again, our net filtration pressure is the difference between capillary hydrostatic pressure and blood colloid osmotic pressure. So if on the arterial side, if our CHP is 35, our BCOP is negative 25, or our BCOP is 25, what do we do to get our NFP? We just take the difference between 35 and 25 and we get 10. So this is a net filtration pressure of 10. And then notice that right here when it's equal to each other, well, what's the net filtration pressure when they're balanced? We have 25 minus 25, so that will be zero. So that means no overall movement of fluid. And then on the venule side, BCOP is still 25, again, it's going to be constant. And then what we have here is capillary hydrostatic pressure is now 18. So we just take the difference. But notice that when BCOP wins out, the number is now negative. So this sign is important, it's not positive because again, because we're subtracting a larger number from a smaller number, we have a negative sign. So basically, 
the sign tells you which way the fluid is moving overall. Is it going to move out toward the outside of the vessel? It's going to be positive. If it moves back into the vessel, it's going to be negative. Now, notice that these numbers over here are also not equal. And when we get, we'll talk more about this when we talk about the lymphatics. But this is why we have more filtration overall in our bodies at the capillaries than we have reabsorption. So yeah, that's what we have with this, this net filtration pressure. If it's positive, it moves from the inside toward the outside. And if it's negative, it draws fluid back into the vessel. And if it's zero, there's still movement, but overall, in the long term, you don't have net movement. So again, positive, this is why the sign is important. And the greater the number, or the, the larger the magnitude of the number, it, the, if the number is bigger, that means that even more fluid is moving. But if it's a very small number, minimal fluid is moving. Okay, so what we have is our filtration and reabsorption, and then let's talk about ap potential applications of this. So albumin, so albumins and b -cops. So albumins are the most abundant blood protein in our plasma. Now, what, why are they super important? And I don't want you to know specific albumins, but in terms of just like our plasma and serum albumins, these are a major contributor. So notice that they're 70% of our conic pressure. So these are very important in maintaining that BCOP. And these are produced by the liver, and I'm, it's a very big deal that's made by the liver, because why? Well, the thing is that you can actually add albumins to solutions to help your blood hold on to water or draw more blood into your, or draw more fluid into your blood vessels. So they're produced by the liver. So what we have here is our blood and our interstitial fluid. Our capillary hydrostatic pressure is moving water and fluid into the surrounding tissues. But we also have our blood colloid osmotic pressure. So albumins are made by the liver. And again, albumins, not all of it, but a major contributor to the oncotic pressure. So our liver is going to make all these albumins and this allows our blood to counteract the hydrostatic capillary pressure or <laughs> capillary hydrostatic pressure and move water and retain water into and fluids in our blood. So we have those opposing forces, but our liver is helping out in making sure that not all of our fluid ends up leaking outside of our capillaries. Now, what happens in liver failure? So liver failure is your inability of your liver to keep up with the demands of your body. So what we have is that this liver producing serum albumins, but if you have something like you, someone has cirrhosis, they drank too much and their liver is unhealthy and can't make enough albumins, well, if your liver starts losing its function and abilities to make its normal proteins, what's going to happen is that you have a decrease in albumins. So if you have a decrease in albumins, that's going to cause, what effect will that have on our blood? Well, that's going to cause a decrease overall protein concentration in our blood. What will that do to oncotic pressure? That's going to reduce our oncotic pressure because now we have less protein content in our blood. With less proteins in our blood, now our blood loses the ability to reabsorb water and fluids into our vessels. So with liver failure and BCOP, we still have our capillary hydrostatic pressure that's still going to move fluids outside of our blood vessels. But with a liver failure and if we have a decrease in albumin concentration, now we're going to have fluid building up in the interstitial fluid. Why? Because our albumins, they're not as at their normal concentrations. So our blood lost its ability to reabsorb and retain water. So what happens if you don't bring that back into circulation and we still have low levels of albumins? This is why we can get things like edema, like someone pulling out a chat. So what we have here is that we have this filtration of this fluid, but not enough reabsorption. So edema is, well, in this example, we have what we call pitting edema. So these people, I think, I might have mentioned this before, but yeah, when they hit, hit this is all the fluid, they don't have fat feet. It's due to all this fluid accumulating here and you press it and then you leave these indentations and it takes a while for this to disappear because this fluid is actually just being held stagnant in there due to a loss of those fluids from the blood vessels to the surrounding tissues. And ascites, yeah, this isn't just like a beer belly. This is due to, again, the fluid being lost from circulation into the surrounding tissues. So ascites refers to this specific gathering within the cavities of the abdomen as well. 
So albumin, this is why it's an important thing and that why you can add it to IV solutions. So if you add IV albumin to IV solution, that's going to increase the ability of your of the the recipient to retain fluids in their blood vessels. So increased albumin is going to increase your blood colloid osmotic pressure. So increased blood colloid osmotic pressure is going to increase your reabsorption because again, the albumin like to attract water, so that's going to bring water back into their bloodstream. Now this is why you might add it. Not, again, it's it's more in actual clinical applications. You just go, you have to kind of take other things into consideration. But this is one possible use of albumin in the clinical setting. Now, why might you want to give albumin? One example, again, there's multiple factors, but this is something that can be used and as an option. And, and we did cover shock, so basically shock is when you're unable to perfuse and maintain blood supply adequately to your tissues and keep your cells and tissues alive. But hypovolemic shock, so it's that hypovolemic shock is due to a lack of blood volume. So how can you get your blood volume back up? Well, if you're losing your volume to your surrounding tissues or losing it outside of the body, how do you bring water and fluid and volume back to your blood? Maybe increase the amount of reabsorption. So this is something that can be an option depending on the actual case, but this is something you can do to that can be used in cases of some cases of hypovolemic shock albumin or increase the blood colloid osmotic pressure to increase the ability of draw more water and fluids into the your blood stream and circulatory system to maintain volume and also maintain pressure as well so yeah that's another okay so oh this is a good time to end and we'll i might have to cover some things like i didn't get to cover like the hormones that regulate blood pressure when we talked about the endocrine system I'll give a little review at the beginning of the next lecture, and then we'll talk about the respiratory system finally. So again, we're not following the book chapters exactly. We're skipping over for now. Like it doesn't mean we're ignoring altogether, but we're skipping over lymphatics and immunology. We're going to table that, put that for exam three. So from the vessels, go to respiratory, all right? Okay, thanks for attending, thanks to our moderators, and I'm glad this time it worked, like I remember to hit play. So I'll see you all on Wednesday, take care, 